Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Tennis and Bagels podcast. This is Vanch and uh, today um, it's just going to be me doing this. Um, and we have, a, we have a pretty special guest here today. Um, if you've uh, listened to some of our episodes before, we've had him on um, late 2020. So it has been quite a few months, but uh, certainly not a stranger to this show. Uh, it's Gil Gross. You may have checked out his work on YouTube. He's doing a great job on uh, Monday Match Analysis. And he also has another um, podcast called Three that he does with Amy Lundy and Joel Drucker. So uh, pleasure to have him on. How are you doing today, Gil? I'm good, Vanch. Thanks for the, the kind words. It has been a while. I can, I can barely remember. It's like a vague memory being on with uh, yourself and Andre. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So we're, ha- we're happy to have you back. And of course, we just finished with, um, with Indian Wells, um, Tennis Paradise. And you were there uh, for, yep. uh, for the second week. Uh, and how was, how was, your, how, how was your experience? How was, uh, your, what were some of the takeaways that you had uh, having gone there for the first time for a couple of days? Well, I got to say the, the hype, the bar is set very high because media members and players and just the marketing campaign, the tournament is very hyped up the whole fifth major thing, the tennis paradise thing. I mean, they are very, they're not shy about how great they think they are. (laughs) So, uh, I, um, I was excited to check it out. Very excited. And I understand where everyone is coming from. The, the grounds are, are beautiful and spacious the stadiums, they, they feel big time. It basically feels the, the size of the stadiums like a major, the center court, absolutely huge. Uh, stadium two is a, is a good size. And stadium three is kind of that classic grandstand style bleacher court, which is, which holds a lot of people as well. Um, the space on the grounds, as I mentioned, but the main thing that stuck out to me is that desert environment that I think is more present when you're at Indian Wells than most tournaments where you're kind of on the grounds, you forget about where you are. It's your, you're in your own little bubble, but I feel like at Indian Wells, you're constantly reminded of where you are by the mountains on the horizon and just the color schemes and the way the, the air is dry and even pulling in, it kind of comes out of nowhere Uh, And there's not that much like hustle bustle of any sort of city around the area. So it really does feel unique because unlike the metropolitan areas that most tennis events are held in, this really is in a desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And you definitely feel like the fans that come there are super well-informed and they seem to really know, follow the tennis year in year out. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely something I've noticed in terms of, in terms of the fans that come there and you, uh, they have really uh, upgraded their facilities over the years. Um, I remember going back there in 2015 and they've really, you know, um, even expanded further and their practice courts, like you can get really close to the players and uh, you can see them up close and personal and you can, they have a lot of fun activities and yeah, they, they really buy into the whole tennis paradise. And it's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of how Disneyland, you know, they always, <laughs> they always say like, it's the happiest place on earth and that's sort of what Indian Wells kind of taps into. And it's like where your, where your dreams come true, you know, it's kind of like that yeah. the old cliche, but uh, you definitely, you definitely, it definitely feels like a major, the way the tournament is structured, obviously with a 96 player draw. And then you have, you know, the, the off days in between. And so you, there's a really nice, this is like a really nice buildup in terms of the big matches. So you definitely feel yep. like the stakes are, are pretty high. Um, even if it's just a 1000, just like the other night, the, the other eight. Um, but yeah, so um, in terms of the matches that you got to see when you were there, uh, which ones were you paying the most attention to and sort of what were your big picture takeaways? I guess you were there for Alcaraz and RBA. So um, that's the yeah. big match. That, that was my favorite match. It was the first match I saw. And it wasn't my favorite. If anyone saw the match, you know that it wasn't my favorite because it was competitive. Uh, it was just uh, a display of uh, a display of tennis that I've rarely, if ever, seen from Carlos, where everything he was doing was working. I saw so many different things done at an elite level in that match. There was a kick serve ace, for example, 
that was incredible where he was standing basically in the doubles alley and not, not quite, but almost and hit a wide kick serve that was unreturnable. And it was just a crazy good serve. Uh, you saw a lot of massive forehands. He was just as bold, just as aggressive and hit just as big, almost on the backhand. He serve and volley made some spectacular volleys. He was finishing at net. Uh, the defense and the movement is incredible. It, it was almost like, uh, it was like a highlight reel that you would put together over the course of seven matches for a tournament. And he did it all within an hour. And it was, uh, it was just amazing to see a player in that kind of zone uh, with that kind of talent. So that was actually probably my favorite match. Yeah. Um, fascinating. Cause we all saw that and we just went, wow, that's a full display yeah. of what Carlos Alcaraz is. So I guess, uh, yeah, but uh, I guess we can kind of jump, we can jump into um, Carlos Alcaraz's tournament as a whole, as a whole. Um, obviously, he had a pretty big win. Uh, he backed up the win against RBA and he beat Monfils in the next round. And, uh, you know, that was a pretty competitive match for about 10 games or so. And then Alcaraz really, uh, really raised his game to a whole nother level and Monfils, is, Monfils just couldn't stay with him. So, you know, what did you sort of make of, of, of his, uh, of the way he took apart Monfils? Cause Monfils was playing extremely well, obviously having taken out Medvedev the round before. And, you know, they, they showed the 124 mile per hour forehand, which is one of the fastest forehand. I mean, probably the second fastest forehand ever. Um, uh, but it was actually Alcaraz's, some of the forehands that Alcaraz hit in the second set that really impressed me. Um, particularly one I remember 107 miles per hour that just flew right by Monfils and it was a mid rally and he just injected so much pace into it, but it was just the way he took control of that match and really, re really just, just dictated. He, he, he knows exactly when to move forward, when to, when to dial back the aggression. I guess, I guess that's one area of his game that definitely still could use some work in terms of just, mm -hmm you know, finding when to stay neutral, neutral because he's so quick around the court. So it feels like, you know, when should he actually rely on his speed since I, I didn't really think he's probably top three or top two fastest guys on the tour right now. So the question is, how much do you really rely on that versus how do you prevent yourself from redlining too much that you just don't overplay on every shot? So it's a, it's a tricky balance that he, he has to find, but it's, um, it was definitely impressive to watch. Yeah. I, I agree with that assessment of, uh, an area where Carlos can be a little bit better. And we see a lot of players have to kind of learn what the sweet spot is. Aggressive players kind of learning the discipline shot selection, Dominic team. It made a huge difference when, when he learned what shots to play and when Daniil Medvedev, I think made his jump when he got more patient and a little bit less aggressive. And I think Carlos will, will do the same probably a lot earlier if I were to guess than it took uh, team and Medvedev to, to figure it out. Um, I kind of had a blind spot in the tournament um, during the men's quarters. I, I attended Monday, Tuesday. I was a little bit off the grid on, on Wednesday, Thursday, then I locked back in, but I, just the, the accomplishment that will stand out for me beyond the RBA match for, for Alcaraz is winning the second set against Nadal, who I regard as the best wind player in the world. Sure. Um, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm always careful when I say of all time, because uh, I, I really know this era best, uh, but Nadal so amazing in the wind, but Alcaraz, the wind forced him to do exactly what we're talking about which is rain in the margins and to play a little bit further from the lines and to be consistent and to use the speed and the defense and try to force Nadal to sometimes be the one initiating the aggression. And uh, it worked very well for him. And he played great and actually adjusted to the win better than Rafa. So the whole match was great, but man, I mean, he should almost, uh, he should almost get a trophy for winning the second set alone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was I was definitely not expecting him to win the win the second set, especially yeah, um, yeah especially with how the first set ended. But um, nonetheless, I think he can take a lot of positives, especially I mean, I guess everything up until the last seven points of the match, where I thought Nadal really, I mean, some of the volleys that he came up with, because usually we think of him as a as a great volleyer, but it's usually backed up by a by a good approach shot, 
and then he sort of just you know has great feel and he can put it in the open court but he was really forced to dig out some really tough ones like at his shoelaces or just stretched out and those were those were some difficult volleys i mean if he didn't really come up with those who knows where we would be because his um speaking about nadal i guess his his week as a whole what did you what did you kind of make of it because obviously we saw the dominant run that he had and he yeah, had in acapulco and really it was survival for a lot of this this tournament in the early rounds right against corda he was down 5-2 in the third and uh, he he crawled his way back and then he had the uh, you know some tough he had a tough second set against Radio Pelka, um, a more straightforward win against Evans, but then, you know, so it, it just started, started to get tricky. And of course he scraped by Kyrgios and he never really quite found the feeling I felt like, especially on his forehand side. Um, he definitely was missing a lot more than we, than we're used to seeing. And uh, he, he didn't quite have the, quite have the feeling. And of course he, he was struggling a bit uh, earlier in the tournament with his foot and then later on of, of course with the peck and the and the chest so yeah. you know what do you, what do you kind of make of this i guess it's it's good that he's not playing in miami and he sort of has a long break before the clay season starts yeah that's definitely good uh the baseline aggression that we saw in acapulco just didn't carry over whatever it was maybe it was the health maybe but i don't think it was the fatigue but maybe uh, I think most likely is honestly just the strange conditions that for some reason he had difficulty adjusting to. Uh, he's complained about the pen balls throughout his career. He did mm-hmm. so for the first time that in my research that I saw in 2015 at Indian Wells, when they changed the balls, uh, they didn't change from a different brand, but the the pen balls changed. He complained back in 2015. Then in 2017 at the U S open, He talked about how much he prefers the U S open to Cincinnati because Cincinnati uses the pen balls. And then at the U S open, they, they changed to Wilson. Uh, Then he mentioned it again in this event. So for some reason, I think he struggles to control the ball sometimes uh, in, in these conditions. And he hasn't won this event since 2013, which means he hasn't won the event since he complained about the balls in 2015 so uh, it's it's a weird thing. Something that we probably don't talk about or think about enough um, is what effect the balls can have on um, the tour and just how players like different events. Yeah, interesting. I actually hadn't considered that. So thanks for bringing that up. But um, yeah, I mean, just I guess if we look ahead and we zone back in on the tournament as a whole. We have Taylor Fritz, obviously. We have to talk about him winning winning mm-hmm. the event. And this is honestly not as huge, not as big of a shock as some were making it out to be, in my opinion. Agreed. Because, I mean, I, I followed Fritz since he first broke through in 2016. Uh, I believe he reached, like, the Memphis final. And he, he lost to Nishikori, but he was the youngest guy to do that uh, in a long time in American history at just 18. And then obviously he had some more pressure and expectations and uh, he struggled for a while with some injuries and then just finding his place in the game and feeling like he wasn't quite sure how he should play uh, Mm -hmm. because obviously he has a great backhand and he has one of the smoothest surface motions I've I've ever seen, but he's quite limited in terms of his athleticism and his mobility around the court. Uh, And just, you know, if you can get him in the corners, um, and, and, you know, I shouldn't say by everyone. I should say mostly by the best players in the world currently. So I think it's great that he's kind of, he kind of knows that and he's hyper aggressive every time he has the opportunity, especially on his forehand. He just explodes off that wing now, which is just huge for him, just going after that forehand. And that's something he's been doing since post US Open last year. And he's had, I think, like nine top 15 wins, something like that. And of course, last year, his run was amazing when he beat um, Zverev and Berrettini and Sinner. Um, and then, you know, probably was a favorite to win that semifinal against Bissigashvili, but then he, he's really carried that forward and played a close match against Stefano said, Sitsipa said the Australian Open, where he, where I felt like he had serious chances to win and probably should have won. Yep. So uh, this was, this was a massive step forward for him, especially going into the final um, against Nadal. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree that this has been kind of brewing for Fritz, a result like this. He's had eight top 15 wins. Um, Mm -hmm. 
in the last uh, since last fall. Um, oh. And obviously at Indian Wells, that's that was the site of many of them. And now I think five of the eight um, or it could be it could be nine. I forget. It might be nine. I, I tweeted it and I know I got it right in the tweet, but I'm, I might be misremembering now. Um, but yeah, a bunch of really high quality wins from Taylor. Uh, I think you're you're right about kind of the adjustment that he's made in terms of going big and playing how he needs to play. I think the big, the big uh, next step that he was able to achieve here is doing that under pressure against an elite player in a big match, because I look at some of the, the marquee matches he's had on big stadium courts at majors, uh, like the one against Djokovic when he was suffering the oblique issue in Australia and Taylor got tight and passive, v- very much, you know, aware of the injury that his opponent was uh, dealing with. And I think it, it hurt him. Uh, then against Tsitsipas, same venue at the Australian Open. He just got tight at the end of th- those three sets. Uh, he, he, his serve was never broken in the first half through the midway point or through the midway point of any of those three sets that he lost. He got his serve was broken at the end of the set as soon as the scoreboard pressure kind of came into play. So that was the big question, in my opinion, for Fritz coming into the final is, was he going to be able to continue to accelerate on his ground strokes and play big in the pressure moments? And I thought at the end of the second set, Nadal kind of was running pretty well and defending pretty well and asking a lot of questions and Fritz delivered. He answered the bell. He played a great tie break. He was dictating almost every single point towards the uh, latter end of the breaker and playing exactly how he needed to play. And that was the big breakthrough, in my opinion, for him from a game perspective, was the ability for him to handle that pressure. Yeah, absolutely. I also thought he did. No, no, uh, I mean, mean, obviously part of this was also, um, you know, Nadal's shot tolerance, I definitely thought improved as the match went on, especially in the second set where he just started defending great making a lot of balls, making, making Fritz come up with the offense. But he was hanging tough in the longer rallies as well. I remember at one stage it was like 15, 15 points, one over nine, nine shots. And I was, that was definitely something, if you had told me that before the match, uh, that's, that's quite impressive to me because obviously we know he's a, he's a great first strike player, but his ability to stay in these long rallies and just kind of wait for the right ball to attack, um, that's definitely something that's improved and man like his backhand return and his his uh, his returning just in general is so tough to deal with especially when yeah. you give him a serve that's kind of in a strike zone up high he can really just tee off on it um and he can do it better he probably does it better off of his backhand but he can do it off of both wings and it's it's just his ball striking is is another world right now and it's it's definitely great to see because He's starting to put it together. Absolutely. Yeah, he's hitting the ball as good as anyone. Um, you have to make a good serve against Taylor or it's going to come back with interest. Right. Uh, he's not He's not the most athletic returner. He's not going to make great stretch returns, and stab returns, however you want to kind of say it. But if you miss your spot, he's absolutely going to make a good return. And obviously with Nadal's injury and him not being able to serve very well, Nadal serve Nadal serve didn't make a dent. And when you look uh, delving into the statistics by Infosys, Fritz's return plus one was actually more efficient and almost just as potent as Nadal's serve plus one. So mm-hmm. the serve was getting totally smothered by the Taylor Fritz return. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think many players in that second set honestly would have probably just gone away and Nadal would have probably had all the momentum and who knows where we would be at and he'd be in a great position to take the match. So it was just great clutch play from Fritz to I think save like eight out of 10 break points in that, in that third set, especially right after Nadal saved the, the match point with a really good forehand. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he found himself right away in the next game down 1540. So to come through there and then play those, three points in the tie break. I thought that swing volley was, was quite shocking from, <laughs> was quite a shocking miss from the, from the doll there would have given him six, four in the, in the tie break. But I mean, apart from that, that's the only really place I could fault Nadal in the tie break. I'm yeah. 
come up with any others, but it's. It's a, it is a tough shot. I mean, going inside out on the drive volley. Now I'm almost surprised and I haven't, I'll admit I watched it live. I have not seen a replay. Um, so uh -huh. I haven't. So, but are, are you surprised that he selected that shot? Because I don't, you don't see it that yeah. often. The drive I'm surprised volley. at the shot selection um, yeah. more than the execution. Cause obviously, you know, it was a big moment and understandable that I mean, he's human. He can get tight in that kind of a spot, but I was surprised he didn't just let it bounce and just, yeah. you know, go, go after the forehand. Right. So yeah, that, that that's my feeling as well because I thought he struck it cleanly too and it just went wide. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's just one of those. But yeah. But I, I really felt like what's great is that the second set was really mostly about the tennis, especially from the mm -hmm. middle part onwards. And so that's where I give Fritz so much credit because obviously, I mean, it was crazy to me how I, I mean I guess. What wasn't so surprising is that he started out going really big in the beginning, more than going more after his shots than he ever did, even in his previous six matches. Because he was always serving really well throughout the whole tournament. I mean, I watched his match against Kecmanovic, and I mean, his serve was just, there was one point in that match where he won every single point on his first serve for the whole set. So he was serving like that, and then he didn't quite have his tempo. And, but in the last two rounds, he really found it from the baseline. He just started hitting forehands everywhere, um, forehand winners everywhere. And the next thing you know, it was already four love and Nadal's all serve speeds were way down and he didn't seem to be moving as well either. So that probably had something to do with it. But I really felt like the second site once, once they, once Nadal kind of took that time out and he left uh, and he got some treatment or tablets or whatever it was, um, he definitely started to feel like he could at least uh, hang in, in in the baseline rallies and he started to find solutions but Fritz just had the answer every time so that was that was very impressive yeah we've seen so many examples even more so with Djokovic but definitely with Nadal as well where when they don't have their best stuff offensively from the baseline they're still going to make balls and run and they're right. going to beat a lot of opponents like that so Nadal was kind of in that mode wasn't his day but he was going to make a lot of balls. And again, we've, we've seen so many players lose to, to that version of Nadal and Djokovic. So uh, yeah, lots of credit to Taylor there for the end of the second set as well. Yeah, for sure. And especially knowing that he didn't, I mean, he didn't know if he was going to even play the match because of the, the ankle yeah. injury that he sustained in the last game against Andre Rublev. So, and then of course he went out and I think he had a proper 25, 30 minute hit later. And then felt like he was good to go, but all of his coaches were basically saying, do not play this match, you know, just, just let it go. And of course we know, we know he's a pretty, pretty stubborn guy. And I think that served him well here in this, in this, in this instance. And he, he, I, I listened to his ten, uh, tennis channel interview actually this morning uh, that he did with Paul Anikon, also his coach and Steve Weisman. And he actually said that, uh, you know, the ankle wasn't really a big problem during the match because I was purely just focused on my, on my game and my tactics and it really just kind of helped me play the game plan I wanted to play. So I think, I thought that was pretty interesting because I knew he had really high pain tolerance. So I thought it was definitely still bothering him to an extent in the match, but it, it didn't seem like it from the, from the match. And he sort of confirmed that himself. Exactly. If, if I didn't know that there was an ankle issue and I was just watching without mm -hmm. any social media, I would not have noticed that anything was wrong. So yeah, I mean, there's kind of a, a desire for the media to make this like a 50 50 thing. It just, it wasn't, it just wasn't uh, because the, you know, I know, I know they numbed his ankle so that it would hurt less and modern medicine and adrenaline. And it just, you know, he was good to go, thankfully. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, because I was worried that we weren't going to get a final. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it worked out. And, uh, it was obviously, you know, the first set was a little bit unfortunate from Nadal's standpoint, but then it did pick up in the second. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, great win by Fritz and we'll see if he can uh, keep up the momentum if he decides to play Miami, um, which I, I would, I would predict not. Yeah. Uh, I, I see him in the draw, but I think he'll, he'll want to, he'll want to play it safe as well. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, just going back to earlier in the tournament, what did you, 
where are you kind of at with Daniil Medvedev right now? Uh, I mean, of course, we we know the two matches he had against Rafa this year, and then obviously you you have the um, stuff going on in between Russia and Ukraine, and you know we don't know how that's affecting players um, on both sides, but. Definitely. Uh, do you think this performance that he had against Montes was was purely just about the conditions and he's a flat hitter and he, you know, it's in the desert and he hasn't really had, doesn't really have that comfort and he he was off in that third set completely and Montes um, took advantage or you know how, what do you kind of put the put the loss down to? I do think Indian Wells will probably be tough for him for a long time, so the conditions I think are are part of it. Um. You know, coming in Acapulco, I, I thought against Nadal, I didn't get the sense that he was really ready to fight for his life in that match. I was sensing mm-hmm. a little bit of acceptance. Um, you know, just didn't seem right. Something seemed a little bit off. So that wasn't all that encouraging, although, you know, that the head to head issues against Nadal uh, might have played into that. Uh, and then, he comes to Indian Wells. I've been concerned all year about his uh, fatigue factor. I just thought with a three week off season and the amount of tennis that he played in 2021, at some point that was going to catch up with him. And it's hard to know when, but I just couldn't see him going throughout, you know, a whole season in 2022 without crashing at some point in time. So I don't know if that point in time is now, quite frankly, it wouldn't be a bad time for it given, you know, no majors in uh for a for quite a while until until Roland Garros um so I think fatigue as well and then Russia Ukraine I think plays into it as well oh and then being number one um that is something that takes place takes some getting used to we haven't seen a lot of that Mm -hmm. in you know over the course of of the last decade plus because four players have hoarded the number one spot but we've seen I think uh, on the WTA side of things, we've seen plenty of examples. You become number one. It's a different feeling that you have to try to get used to and cope with and kind of not put too much pressure on yourself, not let the external pressure get to you. And uh, I, I think it's good for him that he got a little taste of it. And now he's back at number two. He doesn't really need to see that one next to his name. And uh, he'll probably, you know, I am sure he will be number one in the future and he will start to get used to it. But that, I think that's also a factor. Yeah, for sure. The, the initial adjustment and the external uh, expectations has got to, got to be weighing on him for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, he can still get back to number one if he reaches the semis, I think in Miami. So, which I think it suits him better conditions wise, uh, I would think. So that's something to keep an eye on. Do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on his abilities in, in humidity? I mean, I, I do remember Tokyo and he seemed to not love the sauna over there, but that's the only thing that comes to mind. Yeah, of course. And then I do remember Miami last year. Um, he started cramping a lot against, uh, Alexi Popper again. Mm. So yeah, uh, sometimes he, he tends to sort of unravel when he has these physical woes, um, lulls in, in, in matches but at the end of the day he's yeah he's also won he's also won enough matches i think he's gritted his way off out of enough matches in the last one year for me to believe that if he's fit and firing he should be still a pretty big contender there but i just don't know how you know how those things can sometimes affect him in in matches because yeah i do remember tokyo and he was struggling quite a bit in the heat. I remember the first match he played against Bublik and he was quite vocal about that, especially in the, <laughs> in the on-court interview. And yeah. And of course, you know, there's no, um, there's no Nadal or Djokovic as well. And um, I think he's won one Masters 1000 when they opened there or weren't, weren't there. And that was in Canada last year. So, uh, and of course we know he likes those uh, conditions a lot more like in the North American hardcore swing that's where he's had all of his be- his best results so definitely be something interesting to follow he's in the same section as Alcaraz um, and Tsitsipas so that's uh, loaded yeah it's a loaded section but yeah yeah um so I guess yeah we had Medvedev and then of course I know you're pretty high on Brooksby so um 
what was your takeaway from his week? Um, obviously taking out 60 plus after getting blown out in the first set. Yeah. Um, I was on, I was on the grounds there, um, during that match and didn't get to see much of it. However, um, I'm very impressed that he could out duel Tsitsipas from the baseline. It's very, it's a very hard thing. To, I think to beat Stefanos without a serve and, and Schwartzman kind of did it earlier this year at uh, at ATP cup. But I think historically that's been a very difficult thing to do. And if you're going to beat Tsitsipas, you're probably going to have a lot of success on first serve and using plus one and attacking that, that backhand return. Uh, knowing that I know Brooksby had some plus one success in that match and you can weigh in on that, but I I find, uh, I think that's an incredible win for him. And um, from a win percentage standpoint, I think we need to look at Brooksby easily as a top 20 player. Um, I haven't crunched the numbers, but based on, again, just the, the rate at which he's winning, it feels like every single tournament he plays still looking for that title. He's lost a couple of finals, but it feels like every tournament he plays, he's stringing together at least a couple of victories. Yeah, for sure. One of the best players without a, without a title this far. And he's uh, risen pretty quickly and, you know, obviously still uh, concerned a little bit about his, the physicality and how long some of his matches are, but uh but definitely, he really brings it on a big stage when he when he plays one of these top players. Um, I know he had those two match points against Zverev and Acapulco. He just plays all of them really tight. So mm-hmm. it was uh, it was interesting to see Sitsipas kind of outfoxed by that style of play, where you know his opponent kind of uses the variety and maneuvers him around the court in that way. And he just does kind of awkward things. Um, and you know, I don't think Sitsipas really has the same level of respect when it comes to that kind of. Uh, um, uh, a match like coming out of it um, it was kind of the same situation when he played Medvedev kind of early on I was just kind of looking at his uh, press conference and just wondering sort of you know what he thought happened from his step, from his uh, perspective and honestly he looked really confused he looked like he had just been like hit by a bus or something in terms yeah. of his facial expressions and you know kind of what, what he was giving away because you know, you're right about the, the players that do bother him the most would be players like, for instance, he played Jack Sock, right, in the first round. And Jack Sock was yep. up 5-3 in the first set tiebreak and, and the third set tiebreak. And, you know, he'd be quite weary of Sock with the, with the pace and the, the serve going in his backhand and the, the forehand that he has. And, you know, just the raw power that I feel like could rush Stefanos um, and expose the, the weakness, which is the, you know, the backhand slice and the return of serve. And just pace absorption, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but a player like Brook for a player like Brooksby to do that, uh, that's that was uh, pretty impressive because I think I don't know if you know this, but like amongst the top 50 players, um, I think the only players who have who have hit fewer aces than Brooksby is like Kane Nishikori and Diego Schwartzman. And he definitely hits his spots and he has a good he's a good spot server and he's getting the most out of the abbreviated motion that he has. But I'm interested to see how quickly that sort of develops because he's six foot four, and I definitely think it can be an even bigger weapon for him, which is pretty scary already because he can already do so much damage. <laughs> yeah, he he needs to decide though that that he wants to that that he wants to make some changes there because I mean so far I just feel like, and this is probably one of the things that's gotten him so far. I think he he feels strongly like, look, I am who I am. And this is how I play. And this is going to be it. And I think a lot of coaches throughout his childhood has, have probably tried mm-hmm. to change him and has probably served him well that he said, no, I'll, I'm going to keep doing me uh, because, you know, he does a lot of things that are unconventional and uh, kind of backs himself um, in, in that respect. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I'm still trying to really sort of get a read on where his ceiling is at because I'm just, it's hard. I'm really just not sure. Like, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I think if he stays healthy and he can withstand the physicality uh-huh. of of what he does and how he wins matches, I think the the ceiling is super super high. But he's already had injuries. He's had pretty severe injuries already at this stage in his career. And you know, we've seen with a Borna Chorich even with a Juan Martin Del Potro, with a Hyun Chung. Yeah. 
you can, you know, that, that stuff can derail your whole career and you can, uh, unfortunately that can be the undoing of a player very easily. And we obviously hope that, uh, we get to see a ton of Brooks be healthy. Yeah. That, I think that would be, that would be really exciting. But, uh, I mean, I, I guess just looking at all the Americans right now, um, you know, cause obviously you also had Tommy Paul putting up a really good performance to take out Zverev. Um, and you have, um, Tiafo who had a good win against Nakashima and you had, you know, you have Opelka who's put together some pretty good consistent, consistent results as of late, uh, which is, which is a good sign for him. So, you know, I, I guess this year is Fritz. Do you think Fritz is sort of the guy to finish, um, at, at, at the top spot in the rankings? Like, is he our best hope in terms of, you know, making it deep in majors soon? I would say so. Uh, Opelka can be pretty intriguing when he's firing, when, when everything's working for him. Um, it can be, it can be pretty overwhelming, I think, but, uh, we haven't seen in a large sample size, we haven't seen Opelka be consistent week to week for a long period of time. Uh, he seems mm-hmm. to kind of run hot and cold a lot of the time. Yeah. That and, was uh, the case last year. Cause yeah. he had those two big runs in Rome and Canada. And that was basically his best performances. Right. And, and a lot of, a lot of puzzling losses around that it did pretty well at the U S open too. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if that continues, I think Fritz is the man. I think uh, I think Corda has plenty to work on, and uh, Brooksby is a bit of an X factor, and obviously is coming from further away in the rankings um, compared to a Fritz. But it will be interesting to see because Brooksby obviously isn't defending a lot of points um, in the next couple months. I don't think he's going to like clay though. I think he, Mm -hmm. I think he'll prefer the quicker surfaces that will help his offense along a little bit with the way he can redirect and change direction from the baseline and take time away. I think that's kind of how he will, it it does a better job of finding his offense rather than the, the sheer or raw power that is generally required to hit through clay. Um, So we'll see about that. And then, yeah, then you have uh, Tommy Paul. I think will continue to rise, but I wouldn't wouldn't pick him to finish over Fritz or or Opelka. Certainly, uh, Tiafo hopefully gets it going, and Isner I think is still someone who probably at at this point in time is kind of underrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can he still has the ability to to go deep at at in tournaments. I believe. I don't think this is. I don't think we've seen the last. John Isner run. Uh, I really don't, but you know, he he is getting up there and he certainly can't sustain. He can't sustain the schedule uh, or the energy that it would, you know, would require to, I think, get back into the top 15 or anything of those sorts. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I definitely wouldn't rule him out by any means. He took out Schwartzman and actually with that section opening up, I thought there was a real shot at him making the semis. We both picked that. I thought I'd be the only one. Yeah. I I just looked at his head to head sort of against uh, all the players in that section. And I thought, okay, he has a winning record against Dimitrov, Schwartzman, Herkatch, Rublev. Rublev. And he's, he's obviously done well here before and made the final in 2012 and semis in 2013. And he always tends to do well in the masters events in in the States. So, yep. Yeah. But uh, I guess, oh yeah, speaking of Rublev, so he's, he's put together some consistent results um, as of late since he lost to Marin Cilic at the Australian Open who played, a great, who played, a, played really great that day. But, um, you know, since then he's made, I believe, Rotterdam semis and then the uh, two titles after that in Marseille and Dubai. And then he did well here to get to the semis. I, I, I saw him just uh, pretty much dominate against... Uh, Dimitrov in the quarters um, in the second set. And this was a kind of a match he was expected to win on paper, but it was actually really Minio going in. It was going to be a lot closer than, you know, what the ranking suggested with, mm-hmm. I think Fritz being around 20 and Rupa of seven in the world. This definitely feels like, you know, Fritz has closed that gap quite a bit. So, uh, but 
you know, what do you what do you sort of make of Rublev and his his ceiling right now? Because he's obviously made semis of these Masters events and he's made quarters, but for the for him to get to that next next level, it still sort of feels like he has to do a better job controlling what he what he can control. Because obviously we know some of the limitations in his um, uh, in his game. Uh, like obviously the second serve is a still a big thing that he's got to improve, um, but just emotionally, um, I felt like he he lost it quite a bit uh, against Fritz again, and you started to see him really go dark on himself. Yeah, uh, it's good to see the results come together, but honestly, I I don't think I feel like I'm still working on putting my finger on what changed um, because. I think we, we all saw kind of a couple of issues emerge last season and his ranking kind of stayed put, but his win percentage dipped and it was clearly kind of a, a bit of a lesser season compared to 2020 uh, where, where he won the five titles and played what 12 events or something like that. Uh, Yeah. The second serve, the the fitness i think he's gotten he's been worn down in best of five i think he's lost some fifth sets Mm. where he's looked pretty tired uh some players have been able to kind of just use their backhand slice right handers and beat rublev like that i think that's the Mm. adjustment that fuchovic made uh to ultimately Mm. end up getting the better of that head-to-head finally yeah but i just think rublev has felt better about himself in the last couple weeks hitting his first serve better um, and I think indoors on hardcore, that's where the serve plus one game and the aggressive returning can really be at its best. So it, it was, uh, I thought it was a big result for him to, to make the semis on a slow court outdoors to kind of continue that momentum. And now we look to Miami. I still feel like I'm trying to get a read on where Andre Rublev is, is at right now. Yeah. Same same for me, but it's it's a good sign, I, I guess, for him that he's able to consistently beat the players he's supposed to beat. Mm-hmm. And the question will be if he can consistently keep on getting to those quarterfinals and majors, because he's now I think he's he's not made a quarterfinal since that Australian Open uh, last year. So I think that'll yep. probably be the next step. And then of course trying to win a Masters event. Um, he got he got pretty unlucky this year with how Chilich played in that match because yeah that's that's the best match Chilich has played in three years. <laughs> yeah, it, it felt <laughs> it felt like that for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, apart from that, I mean, we're is this just going to be like going forward? I mean, Indian Wells is just going to be kind of like the outlier tournament, kind of like you have for the majors. You have Wimbledon, where you know a lot of these young guys are still trying to adjust, find their footing, and it's a different kind of a different kind of a game style that you that yields to results um in both those areas and obviously you know 2020 didn't happen so so indian wells and wimbledon were compromised as a result of that so i do think that also plays a plays a factor into some of these results i'm i'm not positive um about that actually it's it's definitely something to monitor now because we've had two crazy indian wells in a row, at least on the men's side, I thought the women were actually pretty chalky this year. I think oh, yeah, that was totally. That was that yeah. was all chalk. Um, yeah, yeah. And then on the on the men's side, historically, some of this maybe can be a little bit murky because of just how good the big four. I'm going to include Murray in in this one actually i don't think he played great at indian wells over the no, years yeah this is, yeah uh, this is... okay so we'll go three we'll go three for this one yeah. uh just yeah, how you, you had djokovic obviously winning five and federal winning five and multiple finals for both and exactly and winning three of them pre yeah. 13 so right um yeah the only the only final that was weird before last year was 2010 where lubacic made it and yeah. then beat Roddick. and i don't think anyone was really expecting lubacic uh, at that stage to be in the final there. But other than that, like things haven't been that wild. So, mm-hmm. you know, we got to be careful not to have too much recency bias based on, on the last two tournaments, especially because, because 2021 was in October and we know how results get yeah. weird after the U S open. Yep. That's definitely, that's definitely the case. 
um, conditions were also different in October. Uh, mm -hmm. and the weather was a bit damper and what didn't feel like the same. Because I remember predicting that tournament and being like, thinking that all the all the good sort of clay court players that would be rewarded with a good kick serve would do well there, and it just never panned out that way. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting because Indian Wells throws a lot of things at you with the wind and the uh, the way it changes from day to night. It plays so different, so it's definitely. It definitely helps if you have a high margin game, but you're also you also have relentless offense and you have a big serve. But there's no really one particular formula that I feel like does really really well in these conditions. It makes it just so hard to predict. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would I would really think Nadal would would love it here, but again, it just it doesn't work out that way. And uh, I, I do think big power is nice to have. Now we can yeah. see a bit of a trend with team and Del Potro and Fritz now winning it. These guys have uh, absolutely massive power on the forehand side, all of them. So, you know, maybe that, that can be something to, to watch for. For sure. Yeah. Let's shift gears and let's, let's go to the women's side. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that I, that I thought, and I, I think I tweeted this out as well is, you know, a lot of the chatter about the women's game um, I guess you can say since 2016 or since, you know, whenever Serena stopped dominating. Yeah, post Serena, yeah. Post Serena, you know, has been like, you know, the women's game is so unpredictable. There's so much depth. Uh, you know, there's not, no consistency in terms of the champions. Um, and, you know, I would say that narrative has been starting to change the last sort of six to nine months. If you take out, I guess if you just take out uh, the US Open, right? If you take out the US Open and you take out uh, you take out like Georgie winning Montreal, which felt a bit random. Um, <laughs> but if you just take out those two results, you were seeing kind of the same eight to 10 players week in and week out, like having a lot of success. You know, you're still seeing your Bedosas and Sakaris and I guess Halep having a bit of a resurgence, obviously Barty, Contivate, you know, even though she lost early here. And it's it's sort of the the same sort of four or five and, you know, Shviantek and, you know, you can throw in Ostapenko resurgence as well. It's it has felt more chalk recently, uh, I would say, in terms of consistency, at least, getting to the latter stages. And this tournament was a good example of it with four pretty chalky names. Yeah, I think we're definitely going to, and I, I only think we're going to see that more uh, because I think uh -huh. Barty, Barty is a very true number one. Uh, hopefully the travel gets a little bit easier on her as uh, pandemic restrictions ease. Yeah. And Sviantec is going to be right there now. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. if she's not this year, then I think by next year, she'll be, and I'm not saying she's going to take over for Barty, but she's going to be number one material. Um, and, you know, af after that, I, I do think that there is some room for unpredictability. Okay. Sakari is in her late 20s, totally has all the tools to, to be great and just needs to figure out the mental game and play have, you know, have less bad days in the office or when she does have bad days in the office, she just needs to make them a little bit better uh, than, than they've been. Uh, but, but she can be right there. Sabalenka has had a dip at the start of the year. Muguruza has had a dip that I don't think anybody saw coming at the start of 2022. So I will say that, you know, there is some, there are some questions and, and uncertainty, but I think you do have uh, a lot of candidates to build you a solid core. Krejcikov has been so good. And it's not, I always feel bad when she's left out of these conversations because, yeah. uh, because her results have been extremely consistent. But I think certainly at the top, um, at the very least, which Fiontech and Barty, not saying they're going to dominate every event, but I, I feel like there are true, two true post Serena number one material uh women out there right now so yeah and it's been incredible to see um shiontech's the improvements that she's made uh, on a hard court okay this is a different kind of a hard court but she'll she's backed that up now uh winning 11 matches in a row um got to the semifinals of the australian australian open and it just seems like she really studied her game and kind of understands what she needs to do in in, in big moments and she's kind of She's been taking the ball a lot earlier on her forehand and she's been really attacking with it and flattening it out much more because mm -hmm. we know she always has the sort of the lasso type forehand and she can generate insane amount of topspin on it, RPMs. And 
if you combine that with her athleticism and her court coverage, which was truly a pleasure to see court side against Simona Halep, the way yeah. she was tricking the court and the flexibility and range of motion that she has. It's almost, um, um, you know, that Djokovician with the backhands, um, backhand sliding backhand, like in defense and then just taking that ball down the line at will. It's, it was, uh, it was, it was great to see. Uh, like she seems to have really developed a much more complete understanding of like what she wants to do out there in the big moments. And that's where I've really seen quite a bit of progression. She just looks a lot more calmer to me. I felt like, uh, at stages last year, particularly at the WTA finals, she was starting to get a lot more tense and maybe overthinking things a, bit, a little bit more than she would like. Uh, because we know she's obviously pretty intelligent and you know has a good team around her, but it seems like she's in a she's in a much happier place. Yeah, I think definitely there's been uh, overthinking because you know it's one of those examples of a player who likes to be analytical and likes to think through the game. I'm just impressed though, that she's committed to this transformation. I don't think that's an easy thing to do for a player who's had so much success made round of 16 at all four majors, which includes the the two hard court majors in Wimbledon, obviously. So, you know, it, it would be understandable if she went into 2022 and was just like, oh, I'm 19, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 20 years old. I'm not changing a thing. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing for her to commit to the future and to try something that she believes will take her to the next level is uh, unbelievably impressive in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. And I think she really also looks up to Rafa and she, she was there live, like watching Nadal win the Australian open from two sets of love down. So I think that kind of also inspired her a bit, maybe. <laughs> no, it also, could have. It's no, just funny because it's funny because of the reason why Nadal has adapted is because of, you know, the age and the 20 year old says <laughs> decides that she wants to do it too, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, that, that, that is a bit funny, but I um, did think about that though. I'm not going to say I did not think about that as well. Yeah. Cause uh, you know, she mentioned like, she's been just watching a lot more tennis and just studying, you know, learning, trying to learn from the best players in the world. So I think that's that being in that environment uh, mm -hmm. is definitely something that's only going to help your progress. Yes. Uh, but but yeah, I thought it was a it was a great match from Sakari uh, against Bedosa, because uh, you know semifinals is definitely a place where she's really struggled in terms of if you look at her overall record. I think she's now like five and fifteen in semis and one and four in in finals. But it's a great feat that she's getting there very she's getting there uh, very consistently, and she's a very worthy number three, I'd say right now. Uh, and she she played really well to take that third set against Pedosa, uh, six, one, she really started to find her forehand and it felt like the forehand just decided the whole match. Yeah. And it's, it's funny cause the forehand can also lose her matches, uh, at times it's probably the shot that, that decides, uh, Sakari's level more often than not. Um, and then, you know, sometimes first serve percentage can, can do the same. Uh, it's funny. I thought the wind, in the final was an issue for her backhand, which I don't, yeah. you know, I the think backhand her backhand, is really flat. Yeah. And so she just couldn't, she was hitting a lot into the tape and she was hitting a lot long and it, it was, it was tough because I don't know. I mean, I don't know what she could have really done about that. Um, I thought it was just a disadvantage with the flat backhand. Uh, but yeah, I mean the semifinal, she, uh, she looked, she looked incredible and she was able to conquer the demons uh, to an extent for sure. She also had the win in the semi in Ostrava, which broke the streak. I always think that it, it helps to, it helps to make those mini breakthroughs perhaps uh, before the, the larger breakthroughs. So uh, that, that could have aided her and she's got, she's got everything, you know, it's, she's just such a mental player and that, you know, we know how, how confidence is you just need to start to pick up some results that are going to give you the belief. So uh, I'm, right, yeah. I'm looking forward to clay court season because she's absolutely a player who can contend for all the biggest clay court titles. Yeah, for sure. Um, playing a really tough semifinal against Kritikova last year. Um, and yeah, I mean, I got to see her practice and she is so physical. Like mm -hmm. if you see her in person, I mean, it looks like she's been chopping trees, like for a living. It's she's so 
intimidating that way in terms of her physicality. And I think she really prides herself on it. And she can definitely go the distance uh, for seven matches in a row over three hours. That's for sure. And, uh, yeah. and I think her serve has improved quite a bit uh, over the years sure. consistently. And so is her ranking. Like each year is improved. So yeah, those are all definitely um, some good signs. Uh, I, I guess overall in terms of were there any other players that you kind of thought you, you maybe expected to do a little bit better that didn't or some that surprised you? I guess, uh, I guess I'm just waiting for Contivate to, she, she made the final in Guadalajara, but other than that, I feel like she's had some tough untimely losses at some of the biggest events. And then she's just absolutely, you know, we know what she's done. She's, she's been raking at the 500 and the 250 level, barely, barely losing in the last six yeah. months at, at those levels. So uh, this was another example where she, she lost a, a final set tie break to Marketa Vondrusova. Um, and uh, it's, again, it's not, it, it, it hasn't been that many tournaments, right? You, you're just looking at the U S open, the Indian Wells, uh, Indian Wells in October, or you're looking at the Australian open losing to Clara Towson uh, this year. And then you're looking at this event. I'm uh, you know, you, you just wonder when is that, when is that big title going to come for Nat Contivate? Because I mean, she has been just at a blistering level, especially indoors over yeah. the last uh, five months. Yeah. Her, she's a bit of a WTA Rublev in that sense, I would say. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's definitely something just monitor if she has a, another gear and can break through and win one of these titles that one of these big titles. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think who else. I think uh, Coco Goff. It's still kind of steady progress for her. She lost to Simona Halep, mm-hmm. so I, I I'm expecting a little more from her during the clay, clay court season because I think uh, her game will suit clay a lot better. Uh, so we'll be we'll be interested to see in that. She's still only 18, so I I think we probably need to give her a little more time. But she's. Uh, She's making steady progress, although it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of time for the forehand to improve, I feel like, because that's the one shot that's kind of held her back. I agree. To her credit, the second serve is looking better. Um, so it used to be the forehand and the second serve, and now not that the second serve is a finished product, but uh, I, I would say it's made a lot of improvements. So now you do look at the forehand. The clay should help better from a higher contact point, better with more time. Um, And, and, you know, she's been consistent mentally, I think, and that's, that's the most important thing. And that's, what's enabled her to, uh, I think, have positive progress. I don't think it's a a huge deal that she doesn't have the, the breakthrough that of course uh, Emma and Layla had at the U S open. But you know, at the same time, this, uh, this crop, this generation is incredible. Uh, yeah. these WTA teenagers, um, from, from Towson, who I'm a, a big fan of, I think she's going to be excellent. Uh, even, um, Zhang Xin Wen, uh, the, the Chinese teenager hits the ball. Absolutely huge. Um, 19 years old. There's a, there's a lot. And then, uh, Maria Osorio, uh, who yeah. is now 20. I don't think she's a teenager anymore but uh, she competes super well. So man, there's a, there's a lot there for Coco to contend with. Yeah. A lot more, a lot more depth in terms of teenagers and early twenties. And uh, yeah. So in terms of, you also had Radu Kanu, I guess she, she did well to beat Garcia and she had a really tough match against Petra Martic, but uh, where are you kind of at with her? Because obviously she had a good, obviously she, she won the U S open doing it in a fashion that no one else has really done in the open era. And then obviously there's a, her whole life changed and there's a lot of expectations and she went into the off season, not really having an off season because she was derailed by, by COVID. And then she had, she suffered blisters at the Australian open. And then she's had, you know, quite a lot of outside endorsements and commitments. And it, it, she's still trying to find her, her way on the, on the tour and just, play week to week and get that tour level experience, if you want to call it that. So uh, it might just take her a whole year or two to really get adjusted in this new 
environment she's in she's being forced forced in <laughs> yeah exactly i mean she was you know so new to the tour when she won the us open already so uh, it would not be abnormal for her to to take a while it would be definitely normal the only abnormal thing is she won the us open yeah. uh, and you know you can't you can't put that in the negative pile it's absolutely not it's in the positive pile um, and you know, she's got to keep doing her, her thing and she's got to keep collecting, um, the pay, whatever paycheck she can collect. I think it's very silly to suggest that she, uh, should not be, uh, doing what she can financially. Um, so I would, I would defend almost any criticism that comes her way from that standpoint. And, uh, you know, in terms of her game, she uh, she's going to need to find a mindset where she's swinging very freely and hitting very aggressively because she's never going to be, you know, with her defense and even with the, you know, her shot tolerance, she's never really going to win with those things at the highest level. She's going to need to really attack returns. And I think she's going to need to, to play the offensive tennis, but she needs to find some freedom in her game uh, if she's going to be able to do that. Yeah, I think um, taking the ball early is pretty pretty big for her, and she yeah seemed to do really well on the faster surfaces. So that's good point. Definitely something yeah. that's uh, only going to help her. So we'll see if she can find that freedom that she had at the U.S. Open again. Because yeah, like that, that winning feel, feeling can be quite contagious. And then, you know, like with everything, it just, it's so difficult to sustain for such a long period of time. Yeah. I don't know if she approached it correctly mentally. You know, she was saying, oh, there's no pressure on me. Sometimes I wonder if it's best to just, just accept that there is and uh, try to figure out how to deal with it. And, uh, you know, that's not, I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not taking a hard line stance on that um, because, you know, every player is different. I'm not saying she, she definitely had the wrong approach, but I do think it's uh, it's at least worth considering that, that maybe she was kind of trying to fool herself and it didn't really work because she did look like she was under a lot of stress at least last year. And uh, I think she is looking like a little more comfortable this year in terms of relaxing and having a bit of fun on the court. Yeah. Certainly appears that way. If you look at her social media. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you had Bedosa backing up her semifinal. That was a pretty good result. Still so hard for me to believe that no one since Martina Navratil has actually defended an Indian Wells title. That's pretty crazy. That is. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's hard to explain. Yeah, for sure. So it was it was pretty good for Bedosa to come come that close because she's one of those players that I feel like does everything really well. Like she has a good, really good forehand. Her backhand is pretty elite. Her serve is her serve. Sometimes she she can be a little bit predictable with her um, like her ball toss. You can kind of tell where she's going. But uh, and sometimes her second serve obviously can sit up. But in the women's game, I don't think that's that big of a deal. So it's definitely definitely uh, a player that I would expect to be highly ranked for a long time. You're right. I agree. Uh, there, there isn't much to, to pick apart with her game. I've, I mean, I've, I've seen the ball striking kind of go away at times, you know, where she's yeah. not really centering it and she's making errors. Uh, but obviously that's not the norm. And, yeah. and when she, when she is timing the ball well and everything is calibrated, there's a, there's a ton of upside there. For sure. And where are you kind of at with um, Sabalenka at the moment? Because obviously her whole season so far, the talk has been all about her second serve woes and double faults. But it seemed to go away for a while, I believe, in, in Doha. Um, yeah, it did. If I'm not mistaken. And she actually won a couple, two or three matches pretty comfortably and then lost to the eventual winner, Shion Tech. And then I guess here was just, uh, was just an early loss here. But like, you know, it's is her game going to be able to hold up in the biggest moments, latter stages of majors? I guess that's, the, that's kind of the big question because she did well to get to two semifinals last year and get to world number two. She's won a 
quite a bit of Masters 1000s, WTA 1000s. <laughs> and, uh, but I guess it remains to be seen if she can solve the woes mentally. It seems to be more mental. Yeah, it, it does. At the same time, I would love her to actually attempt to get a kick serve. Uh, as mental as the second serve thing may be, yeah. we, know how, we know how these things are tied together. And the more reliable your techniques are and sure. you know, the more stable you can be mentally. Um, and I've always kind of felt like Sabalenka's second serve was something that was interesting. I've always kind of wondered, is that a strength or a weakness? Because on one hand, it's probably one of the harder second serves to attack on tour. It's one of the fastest. And I, I, I say that without having looked at the, the data, but I'm pretty confident in saying it. Um, yet, you know, she was always a player who double faulted a lot and now it just kind of reached a, a tipping point. She ended up getting the yips. Uh, I, I do hope she kind of addresses it head on and, uh, you know, we don't see a situation kind of like we see with, I don't know, Zverev where sometimes it can kind of go away, but it's almost, it goes away in disguise. It's always kind of there. I think the best way to ensure that that doesn't happen is to actually, develop the the technical side of it um and to find yeah. a newfound confidence in that way yeah absolutely the two things are totally related so and of course, uh, yeah and if you've got a lot of a lot of moving parts like a really high ball toss and you know you don't have all the options like a kick serve and stuff I, I think that's uh that's kind of opening up yourself to be uh you know overcome by overcome by the pressure in those tight situations. So, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely was quite a, quite a two weeks at Indian Wells. And now we're, we're approaching another two weeks of Miami and <laughs> it kind of feels like the tennis cal- calendar doesn't sleep, but it's, <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, Especially this time of year from now, from Indian Wells through to, uh, to the French it's, it's a lot. Yeah. For sure. Definitely is. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess she'll be, should be interesting to see, um, you know, how Miami plays out and how, how the clay season looks because you have a lot of players, you know, defending a lot of points during the clay season and you have even more contenders. It feels like this year. So that's definitely something on my mind <laughs> yeah uh i hope uh i hope the return of dominic team goes well uh it's going to be very interesting to see alcaraz it's going to be a big storyline for the rest of the year now now that he is uh ascending rapidly uh nadal of course Djokovic should be able to play uh be in more draws and play more which is going to bring uh, an added dimension and uh let's see uh if Let's see Titi Pass as well. You know, I mean, he was the best player in the first half of the the clay court season last year, and now he comes in. It's obviously Miami still to come, but now he comes in on um, on not the best run of form for a while, really, yeah. since the final against Djokovic. So uh, he's also uh, an interesting storyline. Yeah, definitely someone I'm uh, not not as uh, sure about because of because of their recent form. And he's got a lot of points to defend. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. And hopefully we just have all the best players playing each other and we get a few good rivalries and, and we, we, we get to see it more than once throughout the whole five tournament clay stretch. Yes. But uh, yeah, with that being said, you got any parting shots or any, any, anything I guess you're, you're doing? Could be anything. No, no parting shots. What was, uh, what were Owen and Andre's excuses this time? <laughs> no. Um, so they're definitely uh, going to be, we're going to have a, we're going to have another podcast with them, but they're just, uh, they're just a bit busy with, uh, Owen's got some schoolwork and Andre's, uh, pretty, pretty busy with tennis Canada. Uh, awesome, awesome. Surfing out the content, you know? So yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, um, good, good luck to, to all you guys, um, including with popcorn tennis. That's been cool to see, um, yeah. no pun intended pop up, uh, recently. So 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, been quite successful so far. So we're just hoping uh, we're just hoping it goes well, and it's good to have uh, a few because the community is kind of small, as you know. So it's good to have a, a few regular writers and a few regular podcasters, and just you know, all kind of come together and create content on a weekly basis. That should be fun and engaging for all fans. Totally. So that that's kind of the goal here. So yeah, with, with with that, I guess uh, yeah, I appreciate you um, coming on on such short notice and uh, uh, breaking down Indian Wells with me, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, we should we should do this again. We should also we should also play tennis sometime. I gotta I gotta study those David Ferrer videos. Yeah. Get a read on your <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's all uh, it's all out there. You'll get a read pretty quick. Uh, this has been fun, Vansh. Uh, we'll do it again for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.